Hello, Linguini. This is Jack coming to you from Northwestern College with Phonetics Lecture 4. On the program today, we have a review of vowels, IPA symbols, and articulatory descriptions. I'll introduce you to a new character in our drama, the R-colored schwa, actually a great solver of problems. And we will discover the difference between phonemes and allophones and learn the six different ways that we all pronounce T without even knowing it. In other words, we're going further down your mouths. Try not to gag. But before we begin, since we're studying language sounds, I thought we would begin with a tidbit. I know I told you before that IPA contains all the symbols of all the sounds used in human language. That's not entirely true, especially considering things like silbo, a language spoken, and I use that term loosely, on the island of La Gomera, which is off the northwest coast of Africa, as you can see. It is a mountainous, craggy volcanic island with wide distances between the sparse population. So if you were, say, on this protuberance right here, and your buddy was over on this protuberance right here, and you wanted to yell over something like, do you have any Fruit Loops? I'm out of Fruit Loops. Well, that's just not going to carry that distance. But whistling, it turns out, carries much further than the human voice. And so over millennia, the inhabitants of the island developed whistles. They're not just calls like birds might make, but they have meaning and complex structures that qualify them as a language, the world's only whistling language. I don't actually know if there's a whistle for Fruit Loops, but that's how they would communicate. As so many languages are, this language was on the verge of extinction. That's probably because there aren't many jobs to be gotten. The future is not written in the language of Silbo. And it was dying out on the verge of extinction, but local schools now require it. You can see the school children practicing, and there are even competitions. So, would you like to hear it? Check this out. Well, I'm not fluent, but I think I did catch the word for Fruit Loops in there somewhere. Oh, there it is again. Before we go on to today's advanced topics in phonetics, we've got to make sure that we have our IPA vowels down. So let's briefly review those. So we're going to note the position of our tongue as we make three different contrasting sounds. And these three degrees or dimensions of contrast determine all, this, all the vowel sounds in English. So make, you have to play along, the E sound and then move it to the U sound. E U E U. You'll feel your tongue pulling back in your mouth. If you kind of bite your tongue on the sides when you're making E and try and make the oo sound, you'll feel your tongue wanting to pull backwards in your mouth. E U. Second set of contrasts, again starting with E and go E A. E A. You'll probably feel your tongue move maybe slightly backwards. That is true, but the most important dimension is it's moving down. E yeah. You might even drop your jaw as you make that sound difference. And finally, starting in with E, E yeah, E yeah. This is relaxation, going from tense to lax. Because the tongue is a muscle, it can be both flexed and relaxed. And when it flexes, it gets sort of some muscle tension and tone, and it becomes rigid. It also curls up a bit on the sides, and then when it relaxes, the sides sort of flap down and it goes sort of limp in your mouth. And without changing tongue position, that's the way you go from e -e, from e to e. So we call e the tense and e the lax vowel. So let's practice those three dimensions. First front to back, high, middle, and low versions. E U A O A A. We can move on to the high, middle, and low dimension. First in the front of the mouth, e -a -a. If you'll actually memorize that, e -a -a, you'll be well on your way to remembering which are the front vowel sounds. And in the back of the mouth, oo -a, oo -a, e -a -a, oo -a. And finally, some tense lax distinctions. Feel the tension just 
melt out of your tongue for each sound change. E ye, a ye, u o, o a. That was nice and relaxing, wasn't it? Almost like yoga. Probably the most important distinction that you need to learn is between the front vowels and the back vowels. We'll need it later in the class to understand how certain words in English are pronounced and why. Let's walk from our chart from top to bottom, front vowels then back vowels. E ye, a ye, a, u a, o a, and then the tongue depressor sound when the doctor sticks the popsicle stick in your mouth and says, "Say ah." Take your tongue as far back and down and out of the way as possible. That's the sound in father. Now, a couple notes. That symbol, the A lovely joined to the E, ligature together with the E, uh, the symbol name is Ash. It's actually an old English rune, ancient Germanic rune, and the symbol name, word, Ash, means ash tree. And they would build spears out of ash because ash has very because ash is a very strong wood. It doesn't splinter or break easily. So guess what we make out of ash today? Baseball bats. Little woodworking trivia for you. If you'll make the contrast between EU, EU, do you notice what your lips do? As if someone you love is walking by, your lips just reach out to kiss them. Your lips go forward and round in that kissy shape. EU. The U, U, O, and A are rounded in English. The other vowels are not. But if you do round them, say take the E, if you round the E, you get E. That's the German U umlaut sound. It's also the French U sound, but we don't have that in English. Many Americans, and this goes by region, it's not an individual choice sort of thing, do not distinguish these two sounds. They conflate them or let them flow together. And if you're like me and you don't have both of those sounds, the one you probably use for both is, is sort of in between, but it's more of the ah uh, in father. I bought something for my father. Ah uh and ah. Uh. Well, what about the center column, Jack? We haven't put anything in the middle of the mouth. There's only one sound. I know there are two symbols, but there's actually just one sound here. And it's the uh sound. It's the sound you make when you don't know what you want to order, uh, or you can't remember the answer to the question about what's in the center of the IPA vowel chart. Uh, it is a nondescript sound. It's not high, it's not low, it's not front, it's not back. It's lazy. It's where your vocal apparatus just sort of naturally goes, uh, when you have nothing to say. And we use two different symbols to indicate that sound. The wedge on top and the upside down E, called a schwa, my favorite IPA symbol, on the bottom. We use them in different situations, though. First of all, the wedge, think of that as the proper mid-center vowel, used in accented syllables or monosyllables like but. The schwa, though, is a vowel that something has happened to. We call it the reduced vowel. Well, what reduced it? What reduced it was it happened to fall in an unaccented syllable. And if you think about unaccented syllables, we don't give them much time, much stress, and thus we don't work very hard at them. And because of that, no matter what the vowel, it most likely comes out as uh. Think about adore, adore, second syllable emphasis, the A becomes adore, or above. Think about photograph. Do you say photograph? Only if you're concentrating, you probably say photograph. Photograph with an a. Uh. Harmony, it's not harmony, it's harmony. In uh, me, that uh is an E. And even pencil. Hand me a pencil, please? No, hand me a pencil. Pencil. Ah, uh, goes to a schwa because it's the unaccented syllable. On to the diphthongs. Remember, not diphthongs, that's what you check your oil with. These are like the glides of the vowel world. And we start with the oi sound, as in boy. Now, you might be tempted to say, well, that's an O as in boat here, going to an E sound as in beat. Remember, though, those are both tense sounds. So say boy, boy. Is your tongue tense? I'm betting you it's not. Otherwise, it would come out bowie. And that's just a little strange, isn't it? Instead, it's boy, boy. Second is the ow sound, like someone pinched you, ow. 
Here we actually have to start at a location where there's not a symbol. And the sound there is a tense version of ah and bad. So tense up ah and you get ah ah and it's a little bit of a stereotype, but it's also kind of true. If you go to Baston, the people in Baston say Baston as Baston. And that ah, that tense ah, that is the sound that out begins with. And from the ah sound, we go up to the lax back high vowel, the handlebar U, or the horseshoe you can call it. Finally, we have I. Many English speakers don't even think of that as a diphthong. We think of it as one sound. But if you lock your mouth down when you start to say it, ba, you can't make the whole sound, I. The pronoun, I. The, the organ in your head, I. It's two sounds. It moves. And it also starts at, in Boston, ba, I. And you relax your tongue as you go up to the E in bit, just the same place that the oi sound ends. So oi, ow, and i. Well, now that our vowels are locked down, I'm going to give you another character, the R-colored schwa. And if in doing your IPA transcriptions, you've wondered, what exactly is this sound? It's not quite this, not quite that. This may be what you are looking for. I bet a lot of those words that you had problems with involve a combination of a vowel and an R. It turns out the R is the troublemaker of the phonetic world. It turns out the R is sort of the troublemaker of the phonetic world. So let's look at what it does to the vowels in these words, each of which has a vowel followed by an R. Standard, assert, mirth, work, turkey, measure, myrtle. Did you know that even though they have an A, E, I, O, U, and even Y, all of those ended up saying pretty much the same thing. And that sound is kind of an err. Uh, kind of like an angry schwa, right? Err. Uh. What happens here is that the R exerts a kind of gravity on the vowel. Or you can think of it as anticipation. Your mind knows there's an R coming, and so your mouth starts to anticipate that R and move into R position, which you remember is sort of in the middle of the mouth. And that pulls the vowel out of its sort of natural, normal front back high low position toward the center of the mouth. And you get a kind of combination of the R and the vowel as one sound. And that sound has this symbol. It's a schwa with a little hook on it. They're kind of fun to make. You make your upside down E, and that's almost like a cursive R coming out of it. Remember that a diacritic is an added little mark that you put on an IPA symbol to give it a, a nuance of pronunciation. Well, this hook means an R-colored schwa. So pause the lecture at this point and see if you can write out IPA transcriptions of these words, each of which contains an R-colored schwa. Remember to use your ears, not your eyes, and to listen for whether the word has one or two syllables. So let's see how you did. Earth. That's one syllable. I know they're two written vowels, but do not trust your eyes. Pluck them out lest they offend you. Earth. The E, A, and the R are all subsumed together into an er, and then a th, the unvoiced interdental fricative, earth. Second, art. Well, I told you there was going to be an R-colored schwa in there, and there is. But that's not all there is. It's not ert. It's art. Two vowels together. We make the sound of two vowels. It actually forms a kind of diphthong between the initial ah, like father, and the er, the r colored schwa, before the t. Art. Art. One syllable, but a diphthong. And something similar happens in our next sound, air. I'm using the pronunciation, air. Eh, as in bet. And then there's another sound, which is the er sound, air. Now, if we take that same set of sounds, air, and raise the first sound from air to e, we get ear, air, ear. Moving down to five, we have fire. Starts with an F sound, and then we have the I diphthong. And finally, the R color schwa, fire. And finally, we have dinner, which is good because I'm getting hungry. De, 
first syllable, second syllable, n, n, and the R colored schwa. So if you're doing IPA transcription and you're having trouble deciding what that vowel sound is, look around for an R, the troublemaker. The R colored schwa might just be your problem solver. We're moving on now to a new subject, phonemes and allophones. And knowing the difference between those two will enable you to use symbols to come even closer to how we actually speak. So what is a phoneme? Pretty much everything we've learned so far is a phoneme. It's a basic language sound. You can think of phonemes as mental dictionary entries, as the way a sound is represented or stored in your brain. So if you hear n or n, you say, well, it's an n sound. And you access the meaning of the word, it's n, based on, I just heard an n sound. And crucial to the nature of phonemes is they can distinguish otherwise very similar words. For instance, bat and pat, bit and pit are the same except for that one difference. And that one difference tells us that B and P are in fact phonemes in English. Those two words I just gave are what we call a minimal pair. A pair of words exactly similar except for one change. And if you notice, in this case, the change is very small between a B and a P. By now you know those as bilabial stops, the voiced and the unvoiced. Is just voicing that bilabial stop enough to change words? It is. It is in English. In other languages, it's not. They're both processed as slightly different versions of the same phoneme. We do that, for instance, with S and Z. Sometimes the plural S is pronounced as an S, like kicks, and sometimes it's pronounced as a Z, like toes. But you don't even think of that. The mind processes the Z and the S, which are just the voiced and unvoiced alveolar fricative, as the same sound as an S. Not so for B and P. They're different phonemes. So we say that minimal pairs, like bit and pit, are the test for whether two sounds are phonemes or the other term we're learning, allophones. If a phoneme is the dictionary entry that resides up in your brain, you want to think of allophones as different performance variations that reside in your mouth. Allophones are slightly different ways of pronouncing a single phoneme. In other words, one phoneme can have many different allophones. Why would they differ if they're all stored in the brain as the same sound? This happens because sounds occur not in isolation, but next to other sounds. They occur in sound neighborhoods, in linguistic environments. So just like we saw before that that R colors the vowel next to it, it creates an allophone out of that vowel. In the same way, nearly every sound exerts a kind of pull on the sounds around it. You can think of it as a kind of gravity, or you can think of it as an energy-saving mechanism whereby we anticipate a coming sound and start moving towards it before we actually get to it. And that affects the placement of the tongue and other parts of the mouth in preceding sounds. And allophones are indicated by diacritic marks. That doesn't mean we're being critical. They're no less than phonemes. It just means that they have an added symbol above or below, before or after, which says it's pronounced with this little nuance. Here are some of the diacritics available to us. Don't worry, we're not going to learn nearly all of those. We're going to focus on one phoneme and on several diacritics that get added to it. But before we get to that one phoneme and start to unpack it, let's think a little bit more about linguistic environment. As I said, all sounds are influenced by the sounds around them. Let's take another example, the example of N. We think of that as the alveolar nasal. Go ahead and form it, N. Now, a little puzzle for you. Pause the lecture and say the words on the say line. And note your tongue position when you make the written N in each of them and ask which ones, their two, are different. I'll walk through them with you. We have new, never, ten, mountain, month, and tenth. Did you catch which two are different? which two your tongue goes someplace else, it's month and tenth. I want you to form the word month, but I want you to do it slowly, and I want you to freeze frame on the N, and then I'll ask you where your tongue is, which is always a good thing to know about oneself, where one's tongue is. So I'll do it with you. 
Man, right there. Where's your tongue? It's in between your teeth, isn't it? Or if it's not in between your teeth, I bet it's touching your top tooth, maybe on the back. Why would that happen? It's because of what's coming. What's coming is a th sound. And if you remember, that is an interdental tongue between the teeth. And your brain, in learning to talk, knows that that sound is coming. And instead of making sound, stop, sound, stop, sound, stop, we flow from and glide from one sound to the next. And so we're actually on our way to that th sound, even as we're making the N sound. And so the th pulls the alveolar N forward. You could say it dentalizes it. That sounds like something you do not want to happen at the dentist's office. And in linguistics, we call that anticipation. The symbol for that allophone of N is N with a little bracket underneath it. And the reason why it's an allophone is that it's a performance variation, but your brain still files it as an N. And these things don't happen haphazardly, word by word. These things follow rules, and linguists love to formulate rules. Here's the rule that applies to month. The phoneme N is pronounced as the allophone N, I just made a fronted N, a dental N, when it is followed by a dental sound. We are on our way in this lecture to hear about the six different allophones of T, but first we need one more tool in our toolkit. What, you say? Good question. Here's your consonant chart again. Do you notice what's different? I've added a bracket. See it up there in the top right? A glottal stop. Like the other stops, whatever goes in that bracket would stop the air and then release it like pa, ba, da, ga, ka. And the place you stop the air is down in your throat, very low down at your epiglottis. Now this is not a sound we can make sort of in isolation. You only make it when you begin a vowel sound. So I go from silence to ah uh, or oh. And the reason that vowel can come out is because that glottal stop gets released. I let the air through to begin the vowel. The best way to locate the glottal stop is if you re-articulate a vowel sound, like ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. That catch in your throat that stops the sound, that is the glottal stop. It's also the sound in the middle of uh, oh, uh, oh. There's a stop there that dams the air before you switch from uh to oh. And the symbol for it is a question mark. And you'll need that question mark in the next section to describe what's going on as we make the six different allophones of T. Say the following words and notice just what your vocal apparatus is doing at the T point in each of them. And I've given you little suggestions for noticing the differences in parentheses. So you put your hand in front of your mouth and say table. Now say kit and think about the airflow throughout the word kit. Now say ladder. I should point out there are two T's in that word. That makes absolutely no difference in the world of phonetics. Next is button. Say it again slowly, button. The question you might be asking is, where'd the T go? Who took the T? Next say truck. And finally say stink. For each of the six T's, I'll give you the symbol on top the name we'll refer to it by, the feature of its production, the symbol again, the environment, because like with the R-colored schwa, it's conditioned by being in a certain neighborhood next to other sounds. And I'll give you several examples, and often there'll be a note down on the bottom. So first is the aspirated TT with a superscripted H. And I give this to you first because it's what happens to a T when it comes first. Again, put your hand in front of your mouth and say table. Leaving your hand in front of your mouth, say stable. Do you feel the puff of air with table that is not there with stable? When the T is the first sound, it's second in stable in a word or a syllable like in tire, it's accompanied by a puff of air. Did you know you were puffing out? You could see it if you had a candle in front of you. Whenever T starts a word or a syllable, it's aspirated. And the reason for the symbol is that there's a sort of 
the H is a breath, right? T table. That's what happens when T begins a word or a syllable. Let's go to the opposite end and look at when T ends a word. There's our question mark that I told you we would use. The environment here is final whenever T ends a word, and it is something called preglottalized. And there's a superscripted question mark before the T for the symbol. Well, let's find this in our mouths. Pay attention to the airflow throughout the entire word as you say hit. Now compare hitter. In hitter, there's a constant stream of air leaving your lungs the entire time. Hitter. But that's not the case for hit. Say hit slowly. Is it hit? That's weird. There's actually a break in the air. Hit. There's a catch in the throat. Where? That's right, the epiglottis. Hit. For some reason, our brain knows that T is coming, and it slams on the brakes on the air right before it, and we stop the air, and then go to hit, kit, cat. By the way, all unvoiced final stops are preglottalized in English. Coming up next, we have a new symbol. That is an upside down J. You can turn your head upside down and confirm that. That is an upside down capital J, and it has a name, and it's called a flap. Some linguists call it a tap, but I prefer to call it a flap. Think about how you normally make a T sound. I told you, you touch the, the tip of your tongue to the alveolar ridge. Ta, ta. But that full contact sport does not happen in words like bitter. It will happen if you say it with too much emphasis and too much attention and too much self-conscious attention to your enunciation. Bitter. Yes, you can say that. But that's not the way we speak. We say, oh, this apple is bitter. Bitter. And the tongue either brushes by the alveolar ridge, just sort of gently grazing it, or passes below it. Bitter. Ladder. Better. We don't say this is better than that. We say it's better. And again, you can com compare. And again, you can compare words, better and bit. The tongue does make contact in bit, but not quite in bitter. You can compare ladder and latte, and you can compare better and bet. So when the tongue just sort of flips by or flaps by the alveolar ridge without making full contact, that's a flap. This, by the way, happens to both Ds and Ts, as your note says on the bottom. So ladder and ladder are homophones. If someone says, do you want this 30-foot ladder or this 10-foot ladder? And you say, I'd like the ladder. They don't actually know what you said because latter and ladder are homophones in normal pronunciation. Remember the example where someone stole the T? Here's the explanation. A T can be fully replaced by a glottal stop, our new symbol, that catch in the throat where there's no T. It's not preglottalized. It's just missing. When does that happen? That happens when the written T precedes a syllabic N. Well, what is a syllabic N? Remember when we talked about consonants and how when you go down the consonant chart, they become more vowel-like, they become more open, and nasals and approximants and even liquids can actually function in vowel as vowels in some words. So if you take the word button, there's really no O in it. But on, but on, it's button, button. And that N is essentially the vowel in the second syllable of the word. It's syllabic, meaning it acts as the vowel at the heart of the syllable. So whenever you have a word where T precedes a syllabic N, the T goes away, and it's replaced by a catch in the back of your throat. Say the words button, kitten, bitten, cotton. And if you said kitten, you're trying too hard. Use it in a sentence. Oh, I'd love to pet the adorable kitten. Kitten. Do you recall which sound was our troublemaker? The one which pulled all of those vowels out of their rightful positions? The R? Well, the R also exerts an effect on T. Say the word truck. Because the R is further back in the mouth than the T, it also pulls the T back, just like it pulls front vowels back. So you end up getting something which is palatalized. 
palatalized means it's moved from the alveolar ridge further back. That is, your tongue hits further back than it normally would on the alveolar ridge to the palate. Truck. Truck. That, by the way, is the neighborhood where we say CH sound, ch. And that is the reason why so many young children naturally, when they're spelling phonetically, take their tonka truck and spell it truck. The symbol for that is a T with a superscripted J. Now recall that J is a glide, an alveopalatal glide, y, yeah, and it's further back than the alveolar ridge. So adding that symbol to T gives you ch, truck, truck. The sixth and final allophone of T is, and I'm sorry for the letdown, just T. The unvoiced alveolar stop made on the alveolar ridge, and under what conditions do you make the plain T? The answer, everywhere else. In every word, when conditions one through five do not apply. And thus, the six allophones together do something that allophones must do to add up to a phoneme. They must cover every potential environment that sound can exist in. And so there's often one whose environment is and everywhere else. So this is the everywhere else one. So in steak and store, the T is not initial, not final. It doesn't come before a syllabic N. It doesn't have an R after it. It's just plain T. And so only in this case do you do what you learned earlier. Put your tongue on your alveolar ridge, damn the sound, and let it come out steak. Let's review. The words you said before were table. Feel the aspiration. I've given you the IPA on the right with the diacritic on the T, table. Kit, preglottalized, where you cut off the air before the end because it's final. That's kit. Ladder, there the T is replaced by the flap, the upside down J, ladder, because it's intervocalic, that is between two vowels where the first vowel is stressed. Button, there the T is replaced by the glottal stop. It is again between two vowels, but with the extra condition that the last vowel is an N, which is syllabic. We have truck with the sort of CHE sound, which is palatalized after the R. Truck, notice the R is in there, it's upside down. And there, as in button, you have the wedge symbol for a. Uh. And finally, stink with a proper T. And notice that there's no N. If you wrote the IPA symbols S-T-I-N-K, you would have stink, but that's not what we say. Notice that that N before a K is pulled into its own allophone. Instead of being an N, it's an ang, stink, like an I-N-G. In other words, that's a glimpse of yet another allophone of N.